The situation is getting worse in Iran as thousands upon thousands of people continue to protest against the Iranian regime. Now, to talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, clashes between protesters and security forces continued over the weekend, which left many injured and a 12-year-old boy dead. He was allegedly shot and killed. Protesters took to the streets chanting, death to the dictator. Iran has been gripped by protests since the death of 22-year-old Kurdish woman Masa Amini. Yeah, so the uh, protests continue. The courage and the bravery is only getting more intense on the part of the protesters. You know, in the last 43 years since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, which toppled the Shah of Iran, the King of Iran, uh, and brought in this Islamic regime, we've seen so many rounds of protests. Um, and the, each time the catalyst was different, right? We had the egg protests, we had economic protests, we had protests over a fraudulent election in 2009, which was called the Green Revolution. But this time around, it's different. And we have never seen the resiliency. We've never seen this level of courage, this bravery. And of course, the crackdowns are getting extremely violent alongside the courage of the people, but they keep coming out onto the streets. Imagine these teenagers, these young, young Iranian professionals, students, PhD students, I mean, teachers, and you know, every uh, profession, every sector coming out a, a, across the country. It's not just in these urban areas. It is even in rural areas and in quiet areas, which you typically wouldn't see these types of protests, but they continue to come out and to show us their bravery and to tell the world their one message. And that's that they want freedom, that they want regime change. Uh, and you know, we, we, we each time we talk about, you know, will this be the catalyst? Will this be the, the one uh, demonstration or protest or movement that, that is successful in toppling this regime? Uh, and how, if they ever had a chance, this, this is it. This is the chance that they have, you know, this is the time that they have proven to the world that they are not backing down. They're making their message very, very clear. Hopefully, we'll see some powerful changes in Iran. Lisa, the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, warned protesters that this would be their last day of taking to the streets. It appears as though security forces may intensify their fierce crackdown on the nationwide unrest. Yeah, they, they they have made threats many times, but this time around, they wanted to draw some sort of line in the sand to say, as of tomorrow, it will be a bloodbath. And perhaps it, it will be, because we have seen this from the regime. This is the Achilles heel of this regime, is the people coming out onto the streets. They are fearful of such a grassroots movement that has taken on this 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 incredible steam and momentum. Uh, and you know, on the other hand, we have reports of members of Basij uh, and Revolutionary Guard families, you know, take, getting uh, visas and passports, trying to get their families out of the country. I mean, that tells us that they are fearful. That tells us that they want to get out of harm's way and get their families out of harm's way, uh, which is good news. You know, it, it may intensify. We might see more bloodshed. And it's very unfortunate because that death toll is going to climb. The number of detainees is going to rise. But on the other hand, we can see that they the protests are actually effective in scaring this regime and, and perhaps making many of them flee and get out of the country. Uh, so we will continue to keep our eyes on it. And, and I thank you, Hal, for bringing attention to this story. The Iranian people, the messages I get from Iran daily are very repetitive. And they are, A, thanking any Western media outlets that are covering this story and B, asking us not to leave them alone, to give them support. As you know, we do not have many reporters on the ground in Iran for security reasons. Uh, but the Iranian people, even though the internet is cut off, they are citizen journalists. They try to get us their stories themselves. And we've seen this as of 2009. So they have used social media. They have used these platforms to uh, inform the world, to create awareness about their plight. And um, the, the least we can do is to amplify their voices where, where they do not have any themselves. Absolutely. You know, Lisa, while some countries have been quite hesitant, the European Union is considering listing Iran's Revolutionary Guards as a terror group. Right. And you know what? Uh, each time this happens, whether it's in Canada or the United States or now the European Union, you know, the, the first reaction we all have is what took so long? You know, obviously, the Revolutionary Guard is, is almost a, a terrorist entity. Why, uh, you know, hesitate? We're seeing this, you know, with a lot of pressure on Canada to uh, enlist them, even though uh, Canada has been very brave in coming out and saying, you know, we, we could condemn this and we condemn the government. And that's a big step forward. I know the Iranian people are very grateful to the Canadian 
leadership for that. But again, what's taking so long to, why the hesitation to call a terrorist group a terrorist group? Uh, and the European Union is finally coming around to perhaps doing that and putting them on the terror list. This means uh, they will not be able to travel freely. Their family members won't be able to, uh, you know, hide out in these European nations. And, you know, just to create this juxtaposition, they are cracking down on people's children. A, a young girl who's 22 years old lost her life because she was not wearing the Islamic headscarf the way that they wanted or the way that the morality police wanted her to. But then again, their own children are gallivanting in Europe and in Canada and the United States and the best universities wearing designer clothing, wearing bikinis, and they post pictures of themselves on social media. So there's no shame in their game. And this is what people are trying to call out. Do not give them the benefits of uh, coming to Western or European nations. Do not give them the benefits of you know, using banking systems, put sanctions on them. We can do whatever we can diplomatically at the very least to curtail the influence of the Islamic regime here in the West. Bringing things a little closer to home for just a moment here, there are reports from the U.S. Department of Justice that the IRS and some of their employees ripped off COVID relief programs and used the cash to splurge on trips to Vegas, some fine jewelry, and even shopping sprees, which included Gucci accessories. Can you explain? My goodness, right? I mean, on the one hand, who's surprised, right? The IRS trying to catch fraud, but yet being the biggest fraudsters themselves. Um, it's no shock. And as you know, here we have um, the uh, economic bill that is going to add about 87,000 new IRS employees that will uh, be fo focusing on catching fraud in, in the middle and low, lower socioeconomic brackets. So, I mean, clown town, right, in the IRS. So here is a report that exposes um, IRS employees. They uh, they ripped off the IRS to the tune of about half a million dollars. And exactly as you said, spending it on, on trips and on spa, uh, day spas, um, going shopping to uh, none other than Gucci, um, a, a lot of fraud. But, you know, this is this is what the bureaucrats do. They rip off, uh, you know, law abiding citizens. And here you have it. In, uh, in in print, in a report that this, in fact, did happen. And of course, with the pandemic and COVID relief funds, there was a lot more opportunity and vulnerability for fraud. Uh, and of course, they took that opportunity. You know, frankly, I'm surprised it was only half a million dollars. That's uh, quite shocking. Lisa, you're reporting on the foreign desk that a mob of Muslim men attacked a Christian church in a suburb of Bethlehem, located south of Jerusalem on Friday night. Now, one church leader from the Forefathers Orthodox Church called the attack simply horrific. Right. And, you know, as you know, Hal, uh, there has always been this fixation on persecuting Christians uh, in the Middle East, um, in, in all sorts of, of, of countries and places by different groups. So we've seen it in Egypt by the Muslim Brotherhood. We have seen it in Lebanon by uh, Hezbollah. We have seen it in uh, Syria and uh, Iraq by ISIS and other insurgencies. And of course, in Israel, where it's the only place where Christians actually do have a haven. And it's the only place in the last two decades where the number of Christians has either remained the same or increased, whereas the number has dwindled in all other Middle Eastern countries because of that persecution. Uh, now we have a church outside of Bethlehem, an area that, of course, a lot of Christians live and live comfortably and safely. And here you have uh, Islamists infiltrating and attacking them and, uh, and where in church where they feel the safest, where they feel like, you know, they are, you know, free to worship and free to live and free to be. Uh, here you have an attack. So, um, you know, this is something that we've covered very, very much at the foreign desk, like Christian persecution in the Middle East. Um, and of course, with the pandemic and everything happening, people are looking much more locally in their own countries, in their own cities, in their own provinces and states. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a very important story and something that we shouldn't take our eyes on attention off of. But that is global persecution for religious minorities and particularly in the Middle East, the fixation again being on uh, Christian minorities. Very, very sad. Lisa, Lebanon's President Michel Aoun left the presidential palace on Sunday, marking the end of a six-year term, and he left without a replacement. The country is leaderless right now.
Right. And uh, the last thing the Middle East uh, nation needs is a political vacuum. That's exactly what has been created. If you've been following uh, what's been going on in Lebanon over the last uh, six or seven years, it's a lot of uh, political um, just uh, chaos, for lack of a better word, with leaders being uh, voted in, voting voted out. Their prime minister is, is an interim minister right now. But more importantly than anything else, you have this influence of Hezbollah over the country like a cancerous sword. And every time there is this political vacuum or this uncertainty, of course, those are the groups that make the gains. Those are the groups that win over certain segments of the population and increase their influence on the country. And that is exactly what the fear is right now. Now, we had news about a newly renovated bridge collapse in India, Lisa, where more than 100 people tragically lost their lives. There was also tragedy in South Korea recently when 153 died in a Halloween crowd surge. Tell me more about that. Oh, this was a horrific story. Everyone who died was um, either in their teens or 20s, perhaps early 30s, young people who just went out to party in their costumes for Halloween. And two thirds of the crowd or more were females. These are women that were, and many of them in witch costumes. Uh, they were in at a party, they come out into an alleyway. And of course this surge took place, uh, many of them being pronounced dead on scene. A very, very horrific and shocking story because they are so young uh, and again going out to party for Halloween and uh, having such a such a horrific and freak accident uh, happen in this way. Very very sad. Lisa the Russian attacks in Ukraine continue unabated. What's the latest? Are there any peace talks planned between Ukraine's Zelensky and Russia's Vladimir Putin? It looks like we're getting farther and farther away from any prospect of, of peace talks or talks in general. Uh, Putin is um, perhaps beginning to claim some victories in certain segments or seg certain parts of Ukraine, while Zelensky is just going on, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, fundraising sprees, asking for more money and weapons from Western states, and he's getting them, which is very, very shocking at this point because it's uh, just throwing good money after bad and uh, trying to fix the situation in Ukraine by giving the Ukrainians some some level of financial uh, and military support, but yet, again, um, no end in sight for this war. And of course, the people of Ukraine, uh, there are some horrific stories that we're covering at the foreign desk with women being raped, being hanged, um, just, just horrific. And uh, again, of course, the people being um, right in the, in, the, in the center of all of this, uh, we know that there is obviously a, an immigration crisis with Ukrainians trying to leave to neighboring uh, countries um, and many of them staying and rolling up their sleeves and saying, this is our home and we will fight for it. So um, a lot of, of bloodshed, a lot of senseless deaths coming from there. But again, until Putin decides that he's going to stop this or claim victory once and for all, I don't think we're going to see any end in sight, unfortunately. You know, we brought in thousands of refugees, Ukrainian refugees here into Canada and uh, welcome them with open arms. It's so wonderful to see them escape the war-torn country. But Lisa, let me ask you something. Is there a point in time when the United States, the Biden administration, or maybe other countries will say, we don't have any more money or weapons to give you. We need them for our own country or for other international affairs. Is there a point in time where governments say, I'm sorry, but enough's enough. We don't have anything more that we can give. Yeah, great question, Hal, because you would think that that point had already passed. A report actually came out late last week here in the United States where a very uh, experienced general said, wait a minute, if there should be an invasion of Taiwan by China, we don't have enough military aid to give out or military um, support to give out because of what we have spent in uh, Ukraine which is it's an incredible thing to say out loud and it's an incredible fact in and of itself uh, to think that we have really put all of our proverbial eggs in this basket of Ukraine that does not look like it will be a victory for Ukraine or for anyone uh, for that matter. It has taken so long that at best we're going to see a, a divided segmented Ukraine with uh, Russia claiming victory in, in certain segments. I mean, what can potentially happen or what what can the aid that the United States and the Western nations and, and Europe provides uh, Ukraine? What could it, it, it what would be the best case scenario? Uh, and I think it, it's interesting to look you know, and weigh it out with the pros and cons and to say we just keep supporting this war. Uh, but this the report that, that came out and we covered it at the foreign desk is very interesting to see how the United States, you know, just keeps going back into the, the piggy bank and, and supporting this. Foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure.